Okay, welcome everyone to this webinar today on EMFs and total toxic load. My name is Dr. Sandeep Gupta, and I'm very excited to have with me today Chris Henderson, uh, FDNP, and Dr. Jill Carnahan. Uh, we're going to be really diving deep into this topic, which I think is of a lot of interest to people who have been suffering from illness of almost any kind, really, uh, because this concept of total toxic load is something that can be applied to a variety of different clinical situations. And so we're really not just talking about one medical condition here. Like, for instance, if you've got multiple sclerosis, you need to know about this. This is rather this is universal info, which can benefit most people in all types of different health situations. So I hope you guys tune in um, for the next um next hour or so um, while we dive deep into this. So firstly, um, for making best use of this webinar, you might like to have a notebook and pen and paper handy. And if you'd be so kind as to give us your full attention for this next uh, 50 or 60 minutes, we'd really, really appreciate that. So first, jumping into Dr. Carnahan's bio, um, Dr. Jill, would you like to talk a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. First of all, I'm excited to be here with you all. You always present such great information, practical tips, and it is absolutely an honor and delight to be here with you. And for all of you out there, I'm excited to spend the next hour with you. Um, I uh, practice functional medicine near Boulder, Colorado, in Louisville, Colorado, and I have been here since 2010. I have a consulting practice, um, but as I realized, we need more integrative and functional doctors. My Recent passion over the last several years is how to get the word out both to patients that there are more options and also just to practitioners that there are more options <laughs> than just conventional medicine. Now I'm conventionally trained. I think it's a great background. I use medications and surgery, and I think it's a phenomenally solid background. But as we know, with the complex and chronic illness that is increasing in incidence, we need more solutions. We need a bigger toolbox. So in the last several years, I wrote a book, published it this year, and uh, worked on a documentary, which is uh, in film festivals currently. And both of those projects are just with my passion to reach more patients and practitioners with the news that there's more options for them to heal. Awesome. And people can find out more about you through your website, jillcarnahan.com. Is that right? Yes. Great. Thank you. Well, a little bit about me as well. I Similarly to Dr. Jill, I had a, a conventional medicine background. I graduated from a normal medical degree from the University of Queensland, which is the, one of the major universities here in Australia. I practiced in the hospital system for around 10 years, including working in intensive care for five years, which is really where the, you know, the extreme side of modern medicine is. And, and I think where modern medicine shines in many ways. So for instance, if someone's had a really acute illness, they've had a car accident, they need open heart surgery, Surgery. Well, those treatments are just fantastic for keeping people alive and uh, and and really just you know supporting the body to get through this really acute hit. But then what I found quite often was after people had been in intensive care, let's say for often you know many weeks, uh, they'd go back onto the ward and eventually be discharged. But quite often they still had lingering symptoms. So it might be fatigue, it might be joint pain, it might be just like, I can't remember things anymore. And it made me realize that, hang on, maybe we're missing something here. Maybe there is also a chronic side, a chronic inflammatory side to illness that also needs a lot of attention. And so I totally transitioned my career into private holistic medicine practice. And I've been doing that now for 13 years on the Sunshine Coast in Australia, uh, just kind of a little bit like a Santa Cruz of Australia. And I founded the Lotus Institute of Holistic Health in 2016 to educate the public and practitioners. So similar to Dr. Jill, that's also a major passion of mine to talk about lesser known causes of disease and integrative medicine and really finding, you know, looking at root cause medicine uh, to really help people to get more permanent and satisfactory results uh, from chronic illness. So you can find out more about me at my website, uh, drsandeepgupta.com. And jumping over to Chris, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, Chris? Yeah, thanks. I'm I'm a bit in awe with uh, you guys. You guys have such an amazing background and um, very privileged uh, to be on this call with you guys. So I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, um, and that's sort of born out of having two pretty major 
uh, autoimmune conditions over 20 years. Uh, I had to look both uh, conventionally uh, in the medical model and also outside of the medical model for relief. Uh, I've, yeah, I, I had Crohn's disease when I was 18 and uh, it all started from there. So uh, very early to be thrown into the mix to try and work out what the best solutions are. But it sort of shaped me and definitely shaped who I am today. Uh, I also had pretty significant uh, reactions to travel vaccines as a young adult. So a lot of this toxic load you're going to talk about. Um, I'm sort of a poster boy for that. And the EMF, uh, the EMF, I guess, conundrum came into my life in 2018 when I traveled to Melbourne for uh, a 10 day uh, holiday and all of my autoimmune uh, symptoms uh, flared back up. And I had to engage experts in that field to start to mitigate that and remove that from my living environment, of which I've, I've taken four or, five, four or five years to do fully. But I, I felt in my own health journey, it's been the most significant uh, intervention that I've done thus far. So uh, Dr. Sundeep and myself were involved with uh, doing a lot of talks around the Sunshine Coast pre-COVID and online talks with doctors as acids doctors and trying to get this message out that EMF is an important part of, of chronic illness. So uh, I'm sure we're going to tease that out a little bit more today. So uh, you can find me at uh, www.bio-light.co and I, I have a lot of education and products on blue light mitigation and we'll be talking about a masterclass for you guys a little bit later. Thank you. We're passing to you again, Chris. For sure. So we're going to kick it off. Uh, first question, Dr. Jill, can you tell us a little bit more about your story in conquering uh, breast cancer, Crohn's and CIRS and how functional medicine uh, helped you on that journey? Yeah, so thank you. It sounds like, Chris, we have a little bit of like in our history of Crohn's disease. Um, my story started on a farm in central Illinois. I was one of five children. I was the second oldest. I was the oldest girl. And you would think this beautiful, idyllic life with corn and soybeans, lots of acreage of running free and driving four-wheelers and playing on the farm and just, you know, growing a lot of our own food. But what unbeknownst to me was happening was I was increasing my toxic load. And as we talk about toxic load, there's this idea, of course, that we have this bucket capacity and the toxins start to overflow at some point in our life. And I suspect very early on, my toxic load became high because of pesticide, chemical exposures and things that, again, we didn't know any better in the 70s and 80s and early 90s on the farm. My dad did like every other farmer and used pesticides and herbicides and chemicals. And my poor, weak immune system and sensitive um, uh, you know, genetics were very susceptible to that. So I was doing fine, went to high school, graduated, did bioengineering undergrad and got to medical school. And in my third year of medical school at the age of 25 years old, I found a lump in my left breast. Now, I didn't think anything of it because 25 year olds don't get cancer, but you know where this is going. And what happened was after a week or so of testing mammogram, um, ultrasound, and then a biopsy, I got the call from the surgeon and I will never forget that day, you know, where I was sitting, what I was doing, because I got the call from Dr. Smith and she said, Jill, I don't know how to tell you this, but you have breast cancer and it's incredibly aggressive and you're in the battle of your life and, you know, things are about to change. And now it's been sadly way more common for 25, 20 somethings, and even teens like 16, 17, 18 to get breast cancer. It's still rare, but you've all heard of it. At that time at Loyola University, I was the youngest person ever diagnosed. And this is a major medical center in Chicago, Illinois, um, at 25 years old. So back 20 years ago, it was still pretty rare. And uh, we didn't really know what to do. So I did three drug, very aggressive chemotherapy. I did radiation. I had multiple surgeries. And about nine months later, after a leave of absence from medical school, I was considered in remission. And I thought my life was about to begin again. I went back to school, back to rotations. And I don't know about Australian medical training, but uh, US back at that time, it's brutal. It is just 36 hour shifts and a very little sleep, poor diet, massive stress. And again, I was uh, grew up as a, a you know farm girl, so kind of a tough mentality. And to admit weakness was not acceptable. So I just went right back into rotations. I probably should have taken a year or two off to recover. I was so sick. I was bald. I had no hair. I was the lowest weight since I'd been maybe like eleven or twelve years old, and I was sick. My gut was destroyed. But because I had grown up on the farm, kind of pull up by your bootstraps mentality, we didn't admit that we were weak, and so I went right back in. And within six months, I remember being in the emergency room 
taking a patient's blood pressure and I passed out cold on the floor um, and was around, wound up that night in the emergency room with a resident on call who diagnosed me with Crohn's disease. I had an abscess that needed immediate surgery. And I literally woke up to the surgeon telling me, uh, Jill, you have Crohn's disease. <laughs> and that was 26 years old. So then that began my journey. I always knew I wanted to do a more holistic approach, but what I did that at that point was really shift to, um, you know, what happened here? How could this happen in, at 26 to have two major life-threatening illnesses? And I remember talking to the gastroenterologist who said, this is lifelong. There's no cure. You're going to be on immune modulating drugs, maybe steroids, and you're probably going to have part of your colon removed over your lifetime. And, and most importantly, he said, it's incurable. There was like no hope. And the last thing I did as I walked out of his office was I said, doc, you know, I want to be part of the solution is, can I do a different diet? Does diet have anything to do with this? You know, what would I, what should I eat? He did not pause. He just said, Jill diet has nothing to do with this. And here's where I took my analytical mind and put it aside and trusted my intuition, because at that moment I knew that doesn't make sense. Even if medically, that's not true that, you know, diet or that it's true that diet has nothing to do with it. At that moment in time, I was like, how in the world can the gut not be affected by diet? Just like how in the world can humans not be affected by EMFs, right? It's the same kind of argument. And these things that we intuitively know to be true by the medical system or the political system or some system out there tells us, though, that's baloney. That's not true. Or if you don't feel well, well, you're just depressed, nothing wrong with depression, but not all not feeling well is depression. And these are all things that I love to empower you as the listener or the practitioners to start to trust our intuitive sense about what is right and good and true. And for me, that was a moment in time when I said, no, that can't be true. And I went on a search to find diet and see if I could make a difference. And I did change my diet. Initially, I went on specific carbohydrate diet and within two weeks, my fevers and my symptoms were gone. Now it took me another two years to figure out the gut and, and heal from that. But I realized diet does have something to do with it. And that was the start of me as a physician, trusting that sometimes things that were taught in medical school aren't always true. So that's first part of my life went on to go into Boulder, Colorado, practice functional medicine. I was doing great. And uh, after the massive flood of Boulder, we had water damage in the basement of my office and I started getting very ill. I was very prone to all kinds of infections. I had rashes, cystic acne. I had, uh, my gut was starting to act up again, even though it'd been totally under control and my uh, cognition was affected. I was having word finding difficulty. And as you know, where this is going, I eventually found mold in my basement. I tested my urine and found mold in my um, mycotoxins, the toxins produced by mold in my urine. And I had to leave that office. And for the next several years, I um, I always say I never wanted to treat mold, but when it hit me in the face and, and affected my body, I had to really learn um, how to heal myself. And so then I became a mold expert. Wow. What a journey, huh? Uh, one thing to another to another, like a triple domino. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And and one one really big thing about that that comes to me is once you've gone through a few illnesses yourself, you start to see the patient's perspective on things. You start to, I guess, it you know, you get you still got all that academic background that you've got. But all of a sudden you start to to get a more three dimensional view on illness, would you say? Absolutely. And those few lessons, like when I chose chemotherapy in this very, very aggressive regimen, I always said, you can always go back through your life and say, what if I would have and have this regret mentality, and especially with illness, when you're choosing a treatment plan. And the lesson there that I tell patients is it's so critical to take the best information you have in the current moment, make a decision, move forward, and know that you made the best decision and you're and don't ever live in regret. And then the same thing about the uh, food has nothing to do with it, right? What I learned yeah. there was, Patients have information and that's the intuitive body wisdom. And they have information that we can never have with our medical training. So we have to engage them and even say, you know, maybe what do you think about this? And we give our best medical information, but there's some power both as doctor and as patient to that intuitive gut sense. And it's actually right on a lot of the time. Yeah, exactly. I think intuition is certainly not um, included uh, as much as it should be in medical practice. Uh, I had a similar thing when I was uh, suffering from severe cluster headaches after having taken antibiotics. I don't know if I've ever told you the story, but I was prescribed 50, oh, sorry, 75 milligrams of prednisone by a neurologist. And part of me just walked out of there and it was just like, no, 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 this is not the path. And, uh, 
And part of me knew it's got to be due to those antibiotics you took. It's just got to be. There's, you know, the, the timing, even though the neurologist didn't show an interest, you know, and I just pushed myself into his his list for the day because I was a doctor at the hospital there. So it's it's like, well, you know, doctors can't always have time to ask all the right questions. And sometimes you've got to know, you've got to be the advocate for yourself, right? And, and my, you know, I knew within myself, no, hang on, it's got to have been due to those antibiotics. I've just got to find out what they've done and reverse that damage. And that was exactly, you know, what I had to do to get well. And, and I got well quite quickly. So, yeah, there is all sorts of different solutions that aren't, you know, that are not necessarily taught um, because medical schools, I think it's still, um, some people say around 40 to 50 years behind the research. And, and so, therefore, academic medicine is really, you know, it's really teaching a, a slightly older paradigm um, than what the, the current research is, is bringing out. So jumping along here, so you've already started to talk about this a little bit when you talked about some of your exposures to pesticides and so on as a uh, as a young person, uh, Dr. Jill. But could you talk a little bit more about the the concept of the total toxic load and why this is important uh, for people with chronic illness to know about and how they can think about this, um, you know, when thinking about their own illness. Yeah, this is the elephant in the room. We all listening here know this, but it is uh, really the thing behind even the pandemic we just got through. There was a huge part of our toxic burden in our environment that was creating a much more severe illness in many people. So the concept of toxic load is we're all born with a bucket capacity to detox. We all have the innate ability in our body, our liver, our kidneys, our skin, our lungs, our organs um, to detoxify chemicals and compounds. But what has happened over the decades, and especially in the United States, um, we are exponentially putting out um, unsafe and untested chemicals into the environment. Even our water supplies last summer in Colorado, where I live, they tested the water supplies for PFAs, which are polyfluorinated compounds like Teflon and Gore-Tex. And literally 100% of the water supply tested positive for a highly high, too high of levels of these PFAs. Now these PFAs are, they're called um, forever chemicals, which means scientists can't even calculate the half-life. So they're there and they're going to be there for generations in our water supply, it's not getting any better. So we need to filter the water and all of that. But that's just one example of the things that we maybe don't even know about that are in our water supply, in our food supply, in our air. And as we breathe the air, live in the world, we are accumulating these toxins in our tissues. And at some point, each of us, for me at 25 with breast cancer, maybe for, you know, the hearty old man at 95 with a cigar in one hand and a tonic in another, you know, they, he, he maybe isn't as affected as I was at 25, but all of us have a different capacity. Capacity. At some point, that bucket fills up with the toxins that we've been exposed to. And as it spills over the top, we can imagine that's our threshold for illness or for start to maybe collapse, like again, for me to get breast cancer at 25. And when we know about this, we know that things like cancer, autoimmunity, and neurodegenerative diseases in particular are associated with toxic load. And bigger than this, I would say the framework of functional medicine is almost always at the core. The complex chronic illnesses are a combination of toxic load and infectious burden. So just really understanding this is at the core root of a lot of the complex chronic illnesses makes it easier to think about how do we actually unload that bucket and think about the many things that are filling up our bucket each day. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's, it's a really useful framework. And uh, one of my lecturers when I was speak, when I was studying integrative medicine, they, they call the college ACNAM here in Australia. He used to talk about a ship that is grounded in the water because it's got 10 anchors in the water. So when he talked about chronic fatigue syndrome, he said, start thinking about all the anchors that the patient has in the water. So it could be it could be heavy metals. It could be you know lack of you know a, a zinc deficiency. There could be mold in there. There could be all kinds of other things. You know, EMF could be one. Uh, there could be there could be chemicals and pesticides, as you say. Um, and so, just by addressing one of those anchors, that may not get the ship going. But really, you've got to have a much more broad view of addressing a whole number of different anchors in the water that are contributing to your toxic load, if you like. Would you agree with that, Dr. Jill? 
Yeah, absolutely. And whether you're a patient or practitioner, this can be pretty disheartening. I always thought old Bob Roundtree's lectures, he was one of the famous functional medicine docs on um, environmental toxicity were, were very depressing. But here's the deal. We don't have to identify every last thing in the bucket. We just have to start somewhere. So like I said, you pull up one anchor, then you pull up the other. It's a good concept because when you think about this as a whole, all we have to do is bring that water level down to give back margin. It doesn't mean you empty the whole bucket, which is kind of encouraging because you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get every last thing, but when you give back margin, all of a sudden the body does what it's supposed to do. Right. No, that's great. Thank you. So now jumping into some more specifics, uh, over to you, Chris. Yeah. I, I was just going to mention too, when you talked about antibiotics, Sundeep, uh, glyphosate is a massive part, not just mm -hmm. in America, but here in Australia. And when you talked about antibiotics, reckon your gut, that's like a petrol 24 seven antibiotic that we're getting. So glyphosate should be at the top of the tree, but Dr. Jill, um, heavy metals are a really important factor in chronic illness. I know that for a fact, and people can get that exposure, like, like mercury exposure through amalgam fillings, um, from eating too much large, large fish species and certain medications, they can get lead, uh, from petrol or paint and industrially or contaminated drinking water, like you mentioned, um, there are many more heavy metals uh, that we're getting exposed to. And as you said, they some of these synergies, the scientists don't even know what the half life is. So we like to sort of dig down into the into the question: Is there a relationship between those heavy metals and EMF exposure at all? I would say absolutely. <laughs> and clearly with it, um, what happens with the EMFs is it really disrupts cell to cell signaling by creating more reactive oxygen. And what happens, it's kind of like the toxic load um, situation where the more uh, things in your bucket you have. So if you already have an issue with metals like mercury or arsenic, cadmium, lead, which are the top ones that we test, there's many more, of course, um, even thallium. Now you're doing green juices every day. Well, green, like leafy greens will pull thallium out of the soils. And so if you're not careful about some of these good things that are supposed to be healthy, um, you can get thallium or other things there. And each of these metals can disrupt cellular signaling. And then you throw on top of that, the reactive oxygen stress of the EMFs, it really exacerbates the underlying um, oxidative stress. I'd like, could I, could I ask you also a question about just me personally, I've had copper dysregulation issues all my life and I just done HGMA to look at copper and by lowering my bioavailable copper, I became less EMF sensitive. So there's a conductivity thing going yeah. on there too. When you're loaded up with metals, they're conductive with this frequency, right? Yes. And I love that you mentioned that because that's something that people aren't really checking. Serum zinc and copper should be checked in all patients because that can really indicate even a metabolic issue that's not from an external source. Same with uh, iron, right? Hemochromatosis and even the carrier, mm -hmm. which means someone with one copy of that gene, any of those times when you have your, because by nature, think about a rusty car, right? That's iron that got oxidized. Well, if it's copper or iron in your body, that's getting oxidized by the EMFs, it's like your body's rusting inside the cells. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah. Have, and also, do you find that checking cryptopyrrole levels on, on your patients can be useful to find out which ones might actually need really high levels of zinc and B6 and, and other associated nutrients? Oh gosh, I was just talking about it today to a patient. Um, yes, I think it's so helpful. It's funny, our labs here aren't as great at checking that. So I often go, there's one little pearl I found is really low alkaline phosphatase that doesn't respond to yeah, anything. Yep. Yeah. It's often a crypto viral issue, right? Right. Yeah, the zinc, definitely. Uh, yes, yeah, so I found DHA labs are quite good for that one. And I actually, a lot of the FDN practitioners um, like like Chris are using that one um, to be able to do, to check with their clients. And, and so what sort of testing do you find is helpful? If, let's say if someone's concerned about the possibility of having heavy metals, what sort of tests might they consider discussing with their practitioner to find out more about how, how significant they have heavy metal toxicity? Yeah, so there's all kinds of ways to test heavy metals. I find still the best way is urine excretion um, and usually a challenge test. And that would be with mm -hmm. given MSA or EDTA um, prior. So you do a pre-test so you get the baseline. At least in the U.S., it's very good to get a baseline um, mm -hmm. more 
and then give the uh, DMSA EDTA and then take a six to eight hour or sometimes 24 hours, but whatever time frame mm -hmm. your test is going to do afterwards, that's probably the best or, or better for body burden. But I still do like serum metals or whole blood metals just because it's a great check of recent exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and then tests like the Quicksilver tri-test is really particularly good for getting inorganic mercury versus organic. And I don't know how many people are doing that, but that's been real helpful for like dentists or people who have chronic lifetime exposure to see kind of the inorganic can be hidden in some of these other tests. And then there's like hair and, uh, and body, you know, like the, those tests as well, which can also do a little bit more body burden. I've not found one perfect test because the studies show like cadmium is better in the urine, lead is better in the blood. And so you kind of want to yeah. be I almost always screen with blood because it's easy. The lab, the mm -hmm. insurance covers it. And then if I suspect a bigger issue, I'll do the urine challenge test. I think, could you tell us what, what um, is the difference between organic and inorganic uh, heavy metals? Yeah. So, um, and I hope I'm saying this right. Cause if it's in front of, but yeah, in, organic is going to be the one that's typically seen in like a whole blood, um, inorganic is the one that's more hidden, but actually more toxic. And so most times when we're getting the organic, uh, and inorganic is actually like, if there's, that's why sometimes there's fungal or yeast burdens with mercury, because the yeast actually, um, takes that organic mm -hmm. and changes it to inorganic. But again, that's the more toxic form. And most of the time, if you're just doing a, a whole blood mercury, you're only going to see the organic. And that's going to be the last three months approximately. So same with someone's ate, eaten swordfish or high levels of mercury fish, you might see that in the blood, but it's not really body burden. But as you look at the inorganic mercury, you, you can see more of the body burden. And I would say like, again, dentists, for example, older dentists that have worked with mercury, I would say 80% of them have very high inorganic mercury. Right. And and same thing is if, if someone, let's say, has a mouthful of amalgam fillings and they're not feeling well, um, you know, should they go in and, you know, look at, at, at seeing someone like a biological dentist or something like that to have it assessed, would you say? Uh, oh, absolutely. Only contraindications would be, of course, get, um, like if they're wanting to get pregnant or pregnancy, because any of these toxic things you don't want to work do yeah. during pregnancy, because in breast milk and pregnancy, you're going to transfer it right to the baby. But other than that, absolutely. A biological dentist here in the U S would just take the precautions to take them out without contaminating the body. And then I would want to do a pretty good detox after that, um, to mm -hmm. make sure the body, I also would be careful about challenging mercury, doing that DMSA. If someone had a mouthful of mercury so that urine test, I would probably not do with DMSA if they had a, a a known mercury burden in the mouth. Right. Would you say it would be safe enough for those kinds of patients to just assume they've got a body mercury burden and, and look at uh, moving towards removal straight away? Absolutely. I would not even test it. Just say, try to do the best you can to get those all removed as soon as possible. Right. Dr. Jill, Dr. Jill, just quickly, uh, Sandeep and I were just having a chat about this slide before we came on air about uh, magnesium and EMF being a depleter of magnesium, obviously as a stressor. But also the the concept uh, that we both studied recently uh, in ionic um, mimicry, where metals replace minerals and vice versa, is a is a very um, uh, uh, very controlled balance of those things in the body. So min remineralizing ratios of, is important, right, in terms of when you're detoxing metals. Yeah, absolutely. What I would say is zinc and mag, you absolutely need to massively increase intake if you're going to do a detox. And then what I do is if I'm doing any chelation at all, I'm doing like two days on and 12 days off or four days on like a short period where you do the chelation, but you're then in those days off, you're remineralizing, you're giving high dose of minerals and mag and zinc are crucial. So I love that you mentioned the cryptopyrrole people because they're going to actually require even more zinc than average. And I love that you mentioned copper because copper and zinc, as we know, if you raise the zinc, you lower the the copper, which is good, but if you don't have enough zinc, you're going to have trouble with the copper as well. So all these things really play together. And you, you also mentioned glyphosate. Glyphosate was originally a mineral chelator. Yeah. So what happens is it basically steals the minerals so that, that that's how it kills the plants. It steals the minerals and allows, that's how it hurts our microbiome because it doesn't allow the microbes in our gut to have the normal minerals they need to survive. It preferentially kills lactobacillus and all of this glyphosate exposure makes these mineral deficiencies even and worse in our bodies. Wow, that's really that's really important. I actually didn't know that myself. I'd mainly focused on its depletion on on glycine, the amino acid. But that's um, that's a really important reminder about the importance of minerals and glyphosate. Okay, anything more on that, Chris? Or we go to the next one? No, just to, just to add, like 
you know, we talk about different continents. Australia um, is having a, I follow Zach Bush. You guys might know Zach. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, yeah. Um, he was at Autism One in 2015 and he had charts about Australian levels of glyphosate and childhood illness correlating in lines going this way and that our childhood illness is outstripping that of the state's in such a small wow. population and glyphosate being going off patent here in 2010. So when it went off patent became a lot cheaper and agriculture was basically uh, drenched with it. So we have a, a big, I think we have a, a fairly on par situation with it here in our, our large continent with a small population. Okay, so jumping on to stealth infections. So Dr. Jill, I know you, like me, you spend a lot of time in your patients trying to look for and uncover stealth infections, all the way from things like mycoplasma, chlamydia, viruses, and tick-borne bacteria. Um, Also, it looks like now parasites and retroviruses and unusual fungi are also becoming part of the um, part of the picture in people with chronic fatiguing illnesses. But do you find that, you know, those who have been found to have stealth infections, let's say it's Lyme or tick-borne infections in general, do you find that uh, addressing EMF exposure has any special significance for those who are recovering from those types of infections? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier, but I think one of the frameworks that's so helpful for understanding this is the complex chronic people who have been very ill for a long time, maybe with difficult to diagnose conditions, typically have toxic load, which we've gone over a lot already, plus infectious burden. And how those two things play together are the toxic load is one of the massive factors weakening our own innate immune system. And our and so, for example, I always say like chicken pox, we get it when we're five. And if we're healthy up until we die, we never get shingles. But many, many people understand this concept because they know it, you know, their 65 year old grandma had surgery and then got shingles or someone under stress. So what happens is that old virus was sitting dormant in the system, chickenpox. And then when um, the patient went into a stressful situation, it popped back up as shingles. This can happen with Epstein-Barr. It can happen with Lyme, Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, Ehrlichia, and many, many more CMV, HSV. We could name so many viruses, bacteria. And if our immune system is robust and doing its job, it basically keeps these old things in check and they never bother us. They're not a big deal. In fact, Lyme disease is a big deal. But I always say if we tested 10,000 people on the street that had no major symptoms, we might find 30 to 50% of them had been bitten by a tick and had Lyme spider parakeets in their system. But if they had a a robust immune system, they're not having joint pain and fatigue. They're going along their life doing pretty well. So this is so critical to think about EMF and infections because EMF is one more thing like toxic load. We could throw EMF in the bucket, just like everything else we talked about. And it's one more thing that weakens our cells immunity, weakens our phospholipid layers, which protect us against infection and help the mitochondria to give us energy. So EMF is one more thing and, and they interplay like this. EMF is one more thing in that bucket, raising our water level, making our systems more weak so that we cannot keep in check old infections and we get new infections. And then the other thing that can happen is the interplay between the organisms and the EMF. Now take mold, for example, mold, they've been shown in studies when you put it under a regular household router um, that the, under that household router, which is a, a low, maybe low or high grade EMF, depending on the, the source, um, will actually increase productions of mycotoxin in that Petri dish by 600%. And so what we see is these organisms are living, Lyme, spirochetes, mold, and they actually may be reacting to the signal of the EMF if they're in your body. So say you have a sinus colonization with some aspergillus from an, a, you know being in a wrong building that was water damaged, and then you get into an EMF high, high-raised building, you might feel worse because that EMF activity on the mic on the mold is actually making it produce more mycotoxins. Now, some of this is theoretical, but I think you and I see in clinical practice that those who are colonized with infections that are under out of control and with a weakened system often, or metals, all of these things play into it, have a much more significant reaction to the EMFs. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had one patient who kind of presented with what we call the classic CIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So they had the classic inflammatory markers elevated, they were failing the VCS test, et cetera. And they got better on the standard treatment, which is usually things like cholestyramine and VIP. Uh, But then they relapsed 
at one point, and those same treatments weren't actually working anymore. And it wasn't until a building biologist uh, uncovered that they had actually a lot of magnetic EMF in their house um, that that they were able to uncover why, you know, basically the, the small amount of, of mold in their home, so it wasn't showing up high on a building biology assessment, but why that was becoming more virulent, if you like, or more aggressive uh, in that case. And it appeared to be that the EMF was, was causing that, just as you say. Uh, one little example, you know, in this day of being environmentally conscious, I'm such a big fan, but one thing we see like solar panels, if they're really near the house, there is on these solar panels and different solar power powered things, um, there can be an EMF with that. And so there are patients who have to figure out, okay, I want to be environmentally conscious, but if I put a big, huge solar panel on my roof, will that actually affect my, you know, mold in the house? And again, we don't know how all these interplay, but I think it's interesting because, there's risk to many things that we even think of as really, really good environmentally mm. conscious uh, things that we're doing. Dr. Jill and Sandeep, um, the doctors can go to literature like in PubMed. Uh, mm -hmm. They've shown 50, 60 hertz can reactivate e EBV. Yeah. Wow. Right. So that's that's. And so uh, that's the um, you're saying that's the kind of frequency that you get from the wiring. In yeah. So your wiring. So if building is that yeah, right? In your bedroom, if you have wiring behind your bed. The field emits three or four meters omnidirectionally, and uh, it can activate EBV. So you, you, this is not uh, when I do my talks. I try to tell people this is not me off gassing my own hot air and just anecdotes. This is in a literature. You have to go and find mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. In the course, we we discussed a case of a patient who was developing seizures to West Nile virus. You remember that that particular paper? And so what they found was all of a sudden they started getting seizures again. And they found that one of their neighbors had turned on like what you call a wireless hotspot modem, where they were able to basically, you know, sell Wi-Fi connection to know people in that area. That's so a much stronger connection to just a standard Wi-Fi, the standard 2.4 gigahertz or um, et cetera. And they found, you know, when they found that out, they went and asked the person to take it off and instantly their seizures resolved. And so, so in some cases, it's very clear cut that there's a, there's a direct cause and effect. In other cases, it may be not quite as clear cut, but it may just be that, it, as you say, it's just one little factor that's contributing and that, you know, you need to get that down and you need to get the heavy metals down and you need to get the chemicals down and then you need to reduce mold exposure. So I guess it's different for everyone, but it just seems I, my awareness has definitely been raised now to the fact that those dealing with any kinds of chronic infections um, definitely need to, to look at this. And, you know, when I first learned about um, tick-borne infections and so on, it was very much just about, okay, you get people on the correct antibiotics and you put, you know, you basically monitor them and they should be fine. Or if they're non-responders, you, you switch the antibiotics around. And I think I think it's now becoming more and more clear that, that we need a much more broad approach to this, um, this problem of tick-borne infections, because it's really, often it's not just one problem in isolation. Would you agree with that, Dr. Jill? Oh, absolutely. I, I love that you said that because it really is the, um, we're taught Occam's razor, right? That's like one uh, solution to a problem, which there's some truth to that. But when we're looking at these complex chronic illness, I love your idea of the boat with the anchors because it's very multifactorial. Yeah, great. So hopefully that was really helpful um, for anyone who's suffering from those kinds of problems. I'm going to talk a little bit about mast cells. So jumping over to you again, Chris. Yeah, Dr. Jill, mast cell activation syndrome is becoming really well known as a condition. Um, it has a multitude of symptoms and can have many triggers, including mold. So people can watch the webinar you previously did with Dr. Gupta on this topic. Um, so in conditions uh, with people's mast cells, one of the first lines of defense of the immune system, it becomes overwhelmed by various foreign invaders and then starts firing off uncontrollably. Is EMF exposure a factor for those suffering from mast cell activation syndrome as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as we know, mast cells, it can be heat or cold or allergens or infections or toxins. And EMF is just one more thing among many. The list is very long in the literature of different things that could possibly be triggers 
Um, and what's happened is, again, these are our primordial defense cells. So they're made to kind of react to the environment. Years and hundreds of years ago, when there was less EMF and less toxic chemicals, they were just kind of calm and sedated and they weren't really bothered. And nowadays, whether it's the you know recent pandemic, the, the uh, COVID itself really affected mast cells or toxic chemicals or EMFs, they're becoming more bombarded. So I think of them like this is the sleeping bear and we're like poking the sleeping bear that's trying to hibernate, but it's really um, becoming much more of an issue in so many illnesses now because there's so many more things that are stimulating the mast cells. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. And, you know, we had Dr. Dr. Afrin come out to Australia just recently and, and, and give his whole approach to it, which is really, really interesting how he... And one of the very interesting things he was talking about was that when people are reacting to medications, um, quite often it's not the medication itself, it's the additives. So, you know, there seems to be all these little, all these little tricks to, um, you know, assisting people who have mast cell activation, like, okay, maybe compounded medications and supplements are the way to go that don't have many excipients. Uh, and so, you know, obviously mold is a really big part of it, I've found, just, you know, just, yeah, really making sure that the person's getting totally away from mold. But just, yeah, I guess always keeping our eye out for this little possibility of EMF being in the background. And so so getting onto a, some more practicals, and of course we get into this in the course a lot more, is is there, you know, is there any sort of first step you would think of, let's say someone's got muscle activation and they just want to reduce their EMF exposure and they're, you know, they're running Wi-Fi at home and they're, they're using their mo mobile phone most of the day, um, got it on at night. Is there some simple things that they could do to start with just to start reducing their EMF exposure? Yeah, I love that you mentioned that because the practicality, we all have cell phones, we have laptops, and the beautiful thing would be go away to the forest where there's no EMFs and no Wi-Fi, but the practicality for most of us is almost zero for that, unless we are on vacation somewhere remote. Um, so what we can do is do um, barriers or protectors. There's many, many devices. It sounds like, Chris, you have some, and I won't say any brands or anything here, but there's lots and lots of ways that you can use mitigation from a platform that you keep your laptop on between your body and the laptop. Mm -hmm. um, from a device that you would stick on your phone to protect you. And all of these have varying, you know, efficacies. Um, but, but I do feel like those things can really, really help. There's all kinds of shielding devices. So you can, um, you know, paint your wall in the bedroom. You can uh, use special sheets and a canopy over your bed. I think the biggest thing would be have someone test or even I have right here beside me. I'm going to show you really quick because it's a very, very simple meter that is, um, it just is a radio frequency meter. I'm sure you guys have all seen these before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a couple hundred dollars a really, it's a professional grade one. So I can check it anytime my wife by my router, my office and see what is actually putting off. Now I am not the expert, right? I use a building biologist if I really need that. But what I saw when I had my house tested was if I were to put a master switch in my bedroom and turn off the electricity just to my bedroom at night, that would decrease by thousands, the kinds of um, hertz I would be being exposed to. So, and again, you can go the way of getting an electrician to rewire your bedroom, or you can just turn off um, your Wi-Fi at night, use barrier protectors between your devices. Um, make sure that you're not sitting right next to your Wi-Fi. You can put it in a distinct place in your home and you can put a router cover and still get just in plenty of um, uh, Wi-Fi in your house. And the types of signals, like you said, with that hotspot that are usually emitted from a router are way more than we really need. So you can protect yourself. And Wi-Fi is pretty high up there compared to even like a mobile phone or a, uh, a cordless phone or even the dirty electricity. So in order of operations here, um, and again, you guys know maybe more than I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think Wi-Fi is pretty high up there. So um, any other tips yeah. that you guys have for those uh -huh. kinds of EMS? I'd agree, I'd agree the Wi-Fi because it's something you can control. And when, when I do go into homes or have those consultations, I try to uh, focus on the bedroom and the sleeping space because we know that's when you're detoxing the most, right? That's when your system's trying to mm. detox. So it, you've got to be very practical. And I try to not, in, in the course, Sandeep, that we've done, we give some very practical tips and go, mm. hey, this is your cell phone. These are like 10 ways to reduce this by still using it. And we say, start with like one or two tips and slowly yeah. work your way through, right? Like we're not about overkill or trying to scare people. Um, you have to integrate behavior over a, a long period of time. That's right. That. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the other really simple one is make sure you turn your mobile phone off at night. It sounds so simple. 100%. You know, it's a, but you know, some of us forget that one. I've had I've had clients who actually sleep with it like on their body, 
And, oh. uh, you know, so there's, you know, that that's obviously a low hanging fruit. That's, that's going to be pretty, pretty straightforward, you know, and uh, so you can do that. You can just go back to a really analog type of, of alarm clock, which is what I've done. Uh, and Mudita have some really good ones, by the way, over in Poland um, that are coming out with really beautiful kind of tones for alarms and so on. So that's that's an, a really simple thing you can do. But if you want to check out the course, there's really a lot of a lot of simple information that you can learn about wiring your Internet. And it, it's really not that difficult if you once you have the correct info. Would you say, Chris? 100 percent. And look, there. There's some lower hanging fruit, but there's also those things we have an addiction to, right? And you just got to mm -hmm. be very slow and low with those. And, and I think we've done a really good job in in getting that balance right between practicality and then giving people an understanding why they'd actually do this, mm -hmm. right? Because it's just another thing you have to do. You have to have a reason to do it. And we've yeah, basically, exactly. yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to mention one more thing, and maybe this is coming, but children, if you're out there, if you're a parent out there, children, their body size, their skull um, thickness, there's so many things about children that make them way more susceptible to damage from EMFs. So if you're trying to babysit your two-year-old with a phone or an iPad with Wi-Fi, it's not a good thing for them. And I'm a really big fan of talking to parents about how much Wi-Fi, especially with the devices, because children are so much more affected than us adults because of their body size and their skull thickness and even their developmental stages. No, exactly. We have, we, we, it's very significant in the course, that topic. And, and when I'm talking to parents about this course they say, or other colleagues or practitioners who I want to, them to share this course, I say, I believe that if a parent goes through this course, it's so well done that, you know, I'm not blowing our own trumpet, but they will, they will know without a doubt that they need to move on this subject with their children. So we built it into this course. And for Absolutely. you, we love it. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and if you're pregnant, uh, we've got to quickly um, mention this. You know, you, you've got to be very, very careful about what, what sort of EMFs your, your fetus is getting exposed to. Um, I remember we once had a very enthusiastic person in the waiting room here, and there was a, a pregnant patient here using her laptop waiting for me to... Um, to uh, come and see her and 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 the guy just started saying you know just so you know as dr jill said just having some simple sheeting um shielding there between that laptop that could be preventing a lot of emf you know getting into that you know that really sensitive growing fetus you know that that really sensitive stage of growth so i think that's really important to think about emf if you're in if you're going through pregnancy or or even just planning to go through pregnancy in the close future all right well we can't finish this without doing a quick plug for the upcoming australian acids conference uh so Dr. Jill is going to be traveling to Australia in September for a practitioner conference. It's run by the, uh, the Australian Chronic Infectious and Inflammatory Disease Society. So, Dr. Jill, what are you looking forward to about that an event and what sort of um, practitioners should consider coming along? Um, gosh, I hope everyone in the country that's interested in integrative medicine in New Zealand too. Um, I'm I'm so excited to join you. I am honored. And and first of all, I'm excited to, to visit your country because I've never been there. But most of all, I think as we started our webinar, I am so passionate about not just training uh, physicians, but we all are overwhelmed by the amount of information that's out there. And especially when we're dealing with the kind of chronic complex illnesses, like we talked about tonight, it can get overwhelming. And what I want to more than anything bring is an infusion of encouragement and energy and just passion and purpose for what we all do and why we all exist because uh, we need more doctors that are doing integrative functional medicine and if I can be even a tiny catalyst in that um, I'm I'm all in yeah so we're really looking forward to this and we, there is going to be quite a lot of talk on the same topics we've been discussing today so EMFs and mold is going to be my topic Dr Jill's going to be talking about more of an overview of uh, of of toxicity environmental toxicity in general and then I think one on the gut uh, and we're going to also have um, some lectures on integrative cancer care by Dr. Tofik Binjiman, a uh, couple of cases on cancer, and Dr. Lewis Elric will be talking about integrative dentistry. So it's going to be quite a broad um, conference. So really recommended for any practitioners. Uh, if you're interested, the website is ACIDS, so spelt with two I's, uh, as it is on this slide, .org.au. So ACIDS.org.au. Uh, it'll be great to see many of you coming along. And you can also purchase recordings if you're not able to make it there on the day. 
So then jumping into our, our offer for today, Chris, do you want to do that one? Yeah, fantastic. I'll definitely be getting those ASIC recordings for sure. So uh, guys, today we're offering a special um, that I've I've prepared a special bonus lesson on artificial blue light and its health effects, which is another really important um, topic when we're talking about EMFs, a lot of artificial blue light from laptops and computers and screens um, later in the day can affect your circadian rhythm in your sleep. So um, this will be included free for anyone signing up to the EMFs Made Simple course in the next 48 hours. Right, thank you. And I'm just going to back up a little bit and just tell people what the what the course includes. So we've got four modules, and and it's really consists of sixteen lessons. So the first module is on what are EMFs exactly. So just some really basic information on what are the different, what are the two types. You know, where do you get exposed to them, and what should we be concerned about? Then in in the second module, do you want to talk about that one a little bit, Chris? Yeah, so look, we've really um, gone deep into the EMF and health effects, uh, also biological effects. So we actually give people examples of, of how nature is affected by these EMFs. So your bees, your plants, uh, your environment, you know, building up to looking at um, uh, conditions such as EHS, so electro hypersensitivity syndrome, which is becoming more common and apparent in, in a certain percentage of the population. We talk about... Uh, how you can uh, address that, what doctors you might want to engage if you feel that you have that type of condition, and and also some practical things in relation to how you might address that as well. Right, and I also have one lesson on path EMFs and pathogens. That's so some right. of the information we talk about today about Epstein-Barr virus and West Nile virus and some other different studies that are out there showing the effect it has on bacteria, fungi and viruses. That's also a really important part of the course. Then we jump onto EMF solutions in module three, where really that's where the rubber hits the road, um, talking about what can you actually do. So as you can see in this particular diagram, we're actually talking about simple things like how do you actually change the settings on your mobile phone to reduce the EMF on it. So, so one of the things is, can you just be using 3G instead of 4G and 5G? Do we have to be using 5G? Well, no, you don't have to actually. And uh, Chris showed me himself how to do this. And, and it's it's very simple. And so there's a number of different tips like that. So that's that's one. Then the second one will be about how do you address Wi-Fi, which is something we've talked about already today. Um, anything more about that module you want to share, Chris? No, just just the fact that um, one of the main facts is your modern day mobile phone and how it compares to the phones that were tested in the 90s for EMF and safety. They, they're totally a, a, a world apart and encouraging people to understand uh, your, your phone has a number of antennas on it, how to switch them off. And again, how to um, use that phone for what it was meant to be used for, which was actually a communication device, not necessarily a data device and or entertainment and a, and yeah. an entertainment device and a netflix device and and these things we're not saying don't use it for that we're showing you how to use it more safely yeah because i feel just the indiscriminate use of ipads phones which without understanding is is yeah affecting potentially all these health issues we're talking about so if we can get people just to dial back their um tap into their behavior understand there's an issue and then dial it back a little bit for example, distance is your friend. If you have a phone call and the phone is half a meter away on, you've got uh, earphones or it's on speaker, that reduces the radiation thousands of times. So just those types of tips. That's great. And then we get into additional resources in module four. So there's some there in that slide, you can see there's some examples of EMF meters. So I think one of them's probably very similar to the one Dr. Gilda showed. Um, so so there's, there's a number of different devices you can look at. Um, we talk about shielding, et cetera. Anything else about that specific uh, module you wanted to mention, Chris? Yeah, again, we, we, we try to be nonpartisan. So there's a lot of um, websites where people can engage and do their own research into these products. Also, we've tried. We've added a lot of um, scientific studies, um, books that have been published, videos and documentaries here. So, without a doubt, you can tap into anything that takes your fancy. I know there's there's documentaries about um, uh, child um, uh, conception and fertility, and and it's just across the board. It's a smorgasbord. So, you you will not undoubtedly miss out on anything in in your wheelhouse if you're interested in any topics on the American health. 
Excellent, excellent. So, so Chris has already mentioned this special bonus for the next 48 hours. Now, for those who want to sign up to the EMFs Made Simple and Mold Illness Made Simple bundle, it's still at the same website, emfsmadesimple.com. And you can get access to both of them for 20% off for the next 48 hours. Now, there's one other uh, product we're offering, which is the Healthy Home Audit with uh, Chris. And that includes uh, a thorough review of your home um, environment, you know, from an EMF perspective and also from other perspectives, including chemicals and mold, et cetera. Uh, it's US-195. This includes a couple of Zoom calls and a written report. Anything else about that, Chris? Yeah, also the lighting factor. Um, I, I yep. speak greatly in the lighting. And I, if, if people are buying this course local to me, I'll actually go to their home. I'll do a lighting assessment. Um, and I can actually show them. I'll have the meter there and sniff around for EMFs as well. So this is for our continent and other continents. And we, we zoom and we can we get you all the right information. I basically compile all the experts that you need to contact if you do require further remediation as well. So save you time on that. Okay, great. So yeah, so Caleb will put our, our technical support guy will put the uh, link for these products uh, in the chat. And, uh, you know, you can access that you can also do a bundle of the healthy home audit and mold illness made simple and EMFs. And uh, so if there's any questions, you can feel free to put them on the YouTube live stream. Uh, anything else you guys can think of in the meantime, that you wanted to um, chime in at this moment? While we're waiting. I just want to say I have hired uh, healthy home people and all of this. You guys are presenting such a deal. So if you're listening out there, <laughs> these guys have a, and, and your knowledge base is, is phenomenal. So I just want to say kudos to the provision of the course and the healthy homes and all the stuff you're doing. And it's very, very affordable for what's out there. So I really really admire your work <laughs> thank you yeah i think that it's like the home environment i think it was dr klinghart once pointed out that there's only one small membrane that separates you from your living environment uh, you know we're basically otherwise totally interconnected with the environment that we're breathing in and that we're um that we're sensing in i guess in the in the in the case of emf and so it's it's such an important factor. And if you want to get well, well, thinking about your home environment, it's got to come into it somewhere. Um, you know, when you when you look at all the possible factors that could be affecting it, you know, definitely diet is going to be huge. Uh, look, detoxification in general is going to be a big one. Uh, emotions are really, really important. But then home environment is definitely one of the major pillars there. And so if if our courses and products can help you guys in some ways, we'd be very honored. I do. I have a question for both of you. I'd love to know what you think. I know for me personally, PEMF, the mat that I have has so been so helpful, but I have had some patients who are super sensitive actually have a little trouble with the PEMF. Now it's a different type of frequency. It's magnetic, but Chris or, or Dr. Gupta, mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on PEMF in rehab or in or the kind of patients who might be, need to be careful with that? I can chat to that a little bit. I, I yep. think what I found, uh, Dr. Jill, is that when I engaged my EMF mitigation expert four or five years ago, um, anything that's plugged into a power source is not necessarily the best, right? Even if you're trying to use grounding sheets, et cetera. And then I've used PEMF, but I've used it in a like a handheld device. Mm -hmm. um, so it's battery operated. Uh, anything that's plugged, long story short, anything that's plugged into the power source creates its own fields, which then could be semi-offsetting the, the positive nature of it. And then also, I guess, someone who's really, really sick using these frequencies have to be uh, careful too because they just don't have the cell energy to uh, to deal with these things or, or detoxes them too quickly. Yeah, I, I found with my patients, I've I tried to get them in nature, like grounding in the morning, get out in the sun like I am, mm -hmm. slowly move into those spaces before going the hard hitting like red light therapy or PEMF, you know, just move them through there. Cyclically. Yeah, that's Love interesting. That. Sorry, I was just going to jump in about saunas as well. So, I mean, infrared saunas, for instance, can be a, a really beneficial healing device, but it's it's just worth keeping an eye out for the EMF levels. 
So there's certain brands of um, far infrared saunas, for instance, which can have quite high reading. So if you're considering purchasing one, just keep that in mind that some of them have quite um, high EMF. So back to you, Dr. Jill. Oh no, that's super helpful. Um, I think you're right with the PMF and that it's it does induce uh, detox and all kinds of good things. And mm -hmm. it's just like if you do the sauna or any of those, someone who's really sick, I, I love that. Um, one of the thought is hydrogen, whether it's molecular hydrogen as tabs, or I have a hydrogen machine that I breathe here. That's this universal. Um, it basically takes a reactive oxygen species, turns it into water. So I think if you do have struggles and you've mitigated your house and you want to think of ways, any antioxidant will work, but I'm a huge fan of hydrogen for mitigating reactive oxygen in our bodies. Yeah, absolutely. It's particularly the hydroxyl radicals, isn't it? That it'll tend to mop up and, and, you know, form, you know, harmless water out of it. So I think it can be very useful. And, you know, for some people I found getting your genetics done and, you know, I know you've worked with Bob Miller quite a lot and, and co-presented with him at times, but he's got a very, very useful system of genetic analysis for people who are finding that even despite the simple measures, they may still be struggling or well, finding out where your biochemistry is breaking down in those kind of more difficult cases can be really useful. You know, sometimes it can be that what we call the Fenton reaction, where people are actually reacting to iron and forming hydroxyl radicals. Um, sometimes it can be due to superoxide, which is another type of free radical, or nitric oxide. So many different compounds in the body that can cause uh, metabolic chaos when they're out of control. So that's worth keeping in mind. I think I think Chris and I are sort of saying that you know doing hair analysis can also be quite useful in the first um, step if you're trying to recover from EMF and 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 look at your heavy metal load that can also be useful in addition to things like the provocation test that you mentioned Dr Jill but if if you're a very hard case I just wanted to put it out there that looking at, at considering getting your genetic your genetics done may be well worth it um, just to find out exactly where things are breaking down sorry guys I dropped out I, I agree wholeheartedly I had a client um in Melbourne suffering from long haulers and they had a look at a, a colleague did the genetics test allowed me to come on the call and he had uh significant uh genetic snips for EMF right. right they can they can have a look at that and he was like off the chart and, and the consult was like you have to deal with that right now um so yeah you need to look with microscope under the hood and that's a, a great test to do mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in some cases, you know, you can get someone who has a significant mutation around their calcium, the voltage-gated calcium channels. They may need to consider doing a low dose of a, a calcium ch um, channel blocker or something like that, If especially if they just can't avoid. For instance, let's say you mitigated your home, but your workplace is still really, you know, very high Wi-Fi. You know, I still have the situation. I'm working in a corporate center here. So as you know, Chris, uh, my home's pretty good, but I still yeah. get exposed to a certain degree here. So if I was super sensitive, I've actually got one little mutation on my calcium CAC gene. If I was like really super sensitive, I would consider just doing a little bit of a compounded medication just to dampen down that uh, that sensitivity on the days that I, I can't avoid being exposed. So I guess you could say there are some other fine little options like that that you can consider. We also had a client, Dr. Sundeep, uh, significantly um, MCS, and a farmer. Um, so you, you empathize with him, Jill. Uh, just started um, the calcium channel blocking meds and his life has changed. Uh, oh. So very significant for a 75-year-old man who couldn't tolerate environment. Yeah. Wow, very impressive. All right, guys. Well, I'd like to say thank you to both of you for coming along today, Chris and Dr. Jill. It's been a really, really enjoyable webinar, and I hope the audience have got a lot out of it. And I uh, hope that you check out our courses and consider signing up if it's something that you're looking to learn more about. And a big thanks to Kayla Brudd for technical support. Um, so have a great rest of the day, everyone, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, thank guys. You. Appreciate it.